This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Benjamin Netanyahu's government gets underway and controversy erupts over the National Security Minister's visit to the Temple Mount, plus grave desecrations in Jerusalem. And a rabbi outlines the impact of anti-Semitic messages coming from celebrities. And a new generation learns about the visionary who saw the necessity of the Jewish people having their own state. All this and more on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. After a week in office, Israel's new government is already facing international outcry and criticism from the UN. CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl explains what led to this reaction. Israel's incoming National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gvir created an uproar by visiting Jerusalem's Temple Mount. The location is an international point of contention as it's home to Islam's Al-Aqsa Mosque and Dome of the Rock, as well as being Judaism's holiest site. Ben-Gvir's surprise visit is the first by an Israeli minister in almost five years. The United States stands firmly for preservation of the historic status quo with respect to the holy sites in Jerusalem. Uh, we oppose any unilateral actions that undercut the historic status quo. They are unacceptable. Ben Gvir maintains his visit did not violate the status quo. While Israel's high court guarantees freedom of access to the Holy Plateau, including freedom of worship, Israeli police prevent anyone other than Muslims from praying there out of fear of disturbances. The Temple Mount is open to all. Muslims and Christians come up here, and yes, also Jews. In a government I'm a member of, there will be no discrimination, and Jews will come up and visit the Temple Mount. We make it clear to Hamas that we aren't surrendering, we aren't capitulating, we aren't flinching. Palestinians threatened retaliation that resulted in one rocket launched towards southern Israel that fell in an open area. The Israeli minister Ben Gavir's storming of the blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque this morning constitutes a serious challenge to the emotions of our Palestinian people. This provocative behavior by the right-wing government will open the door wide for real waves of escalation, all of which have repercussions for the entire region. A statement from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office confirmed that Israel is committed to maintaining the status quo on the Temple Mount. We will not be dictated to by Hamas, under the status quo, ministers have gone up to the Temple Mount in recent years, including Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan. Therefore, the claim that a change has been made in the status quo is without foundation. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. At the top of Netanyahu's agenda is a controversial goal to expand the Jewish presence throughout the country, including the biblical lands of Judea and Samaria, which the world calls the West Bank. Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl again brings us the story from Jerusalem. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu began his latest term in office in front of a rowdy Knesset. Among the goals of his new government, prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon and continue to seek peace agreements with Israel's Arab neighbors. Knesset members, I don't need to hear your yelling to know that we have certain disagreements. I'll say one thing, we do have a wide agreement between us on most of the tasks and challenges before us. It took months of campaigning followed by eight more weeks of bargaining to form the government. Opposition to Knesset members, losing elections isn't the end of democracy, it's the essence of democracy. Before the swearing-in ceremony, Netanyahu's Likud party issued a statement that the new coalition would advance and develop settlement in all parts of the land of Israel, in the Galilee, Negev, Golan Heights, and Judea and Samaria. Well, I think it's good that the coalition platform is created from the beginning and everybody understands uh, what this government stands for, which is very much in line with what the voters who voted for this right-wing government stand for. Much of the world considers the West Bank settlements illegal. Although more than half a million Jews live there, the United States has often constrained Israeli expansion there. Particularly with regard to settlements in uh, previous administrations in the United States, uh, Netanyahu was forced actually to, um, to limit building in the settlements of Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, which is commonly known as the West Bank. And Israel, as Netanyahu said in the coalition agreement says, has uh, exclusive rights to all the land within the land of Israel, including Judea and Samaria. 
Voters, however, supported this government in part to promote such an expansion and also to stop the growth of Palestinian violence. I think uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. I think, first of all, we need to realize that the government that has been formed has been chosen in a democratic system by the majority of the people of Israel who wanted to see a change from the previous government. Outgoing government members are unhappy with certain policy changes and appointments, including Itamar ben Gavir as the new Minister for National Security. Oded Revivi, mayor of Ifrat, a Jewish community in Judea and Samaria, says the incoming government is already tempering its stand. I think people need to remember in a nutshell that politicians they campaign for their base, but they govern for the people. And once they sit on the chair of the minister or of the chair of power, they understand that there are limits to the power, and there is also some compromises that need to be made in order to actually move forward. The new government could also benefit from sustained media attacks and foreign criticism. The expectations have been set so low that any advances toward peace or security may be well received by the public. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Dozens of Jewish Israelis paid a solidarity visit to the, a Christian cemetery in Jerusalem after it was desecrated, apparently by Orthodox Jews, earlier this week. As Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports, many are calling for stricter punishment for hate crimes. Security camera footage on social media apparently shows two Jewish men wearing kippahs or yarmulkes entering the cemetery. Then they pull over tombstones and damage graves. It has been uh, vandalized in an ongoing way uh, over many years. But several days ago, uh, the vandalism was uh, quite severe. At least 30 tombstones were destroyed. Many of those tombstones had crosses. So this was uh, certainly an act of bigotry or anti-Christian vandalism. David Pelegi of Christ Church, part of the Anglican body that runs the cemetery, has seen a rise in acts against Christians over the past few years from a group of religious extremists. We're calling upon the state to take firm action and not only to repair the cemetery, which we think they should do, but at the same time toughen the laws against religious hate crimes. In a statement, Israel's foreign ministry condemned the vandalism, saying, this immoral act is an affront to religion and the perpetrators should be prosecuted. Since its establishment, the state of Israel has been committed to freedom of worship and religion for all and will continue this policy. The cemetery is more than 150 years old. Buried here are many generations of Protestant men and women who came from Europe and the United States to serve the people of the Holy Land. We have buried here teachers, doctors, pastors, Bible translators. There's um, Horatio Spafford who wrote uh, It Is Well With My Soul. There's um, Bishop Michael Solomon Alexander, the first Jewish bishop in Jerusalem after a gap of almost 18 100 years. Conrad Schick, the first archaeologist and the first town planner, the first architect in Jerusalem. Following this attack, dozens of Israelis organized by Tag Meir visited the cemetery to express their solidarity with the Christians and urge their government to act. I came here today because I'm sad and ashamed to be standing in this very important historic graveyard of people who have built Jerusalem and people who have lived and loved Jerusalem. Their graves were desecrated and this must never happen in any place in the world for any religion and of course not here in the holy city of God. The atrocity has been made by individuals that we don't know how many people give them the back wind but we are here to say if you cannot fight the darkness, you're supposed to enrich the light and nourish the light. My family arrived in 1809, and here I see tombs from that period, and they probably knew them. And to see the desecration of these tombs by Orthodox Jews is something that's totally unacceptable, very much like it would be unacceptable to see desecration of Jewish tombs in Europe. It is act of hatred, of violence, which has no place in modern Israel, and these are the heritage of the country. Pelagi says in addition to its history, the cemetery is still in use today and has a huge spiritual significance. We take inspiration from the lives of these saints. 
their love, their self-sacrifice, uh, their humility, their willingness to spend a lifetime here helping and bearing witness to Jesus, the Messiah, and to remember with gratitude the grace of God and how God used very ordinary, simple human beings often to accomplish his purposes in this country. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Mount Zion Protestant Cemetery, Jerusalem. Up next, a rabbi describes the new face of anti-Semitism and how it surfaced in 2022. The Simon Wiesenthal Center released its annual report on the top 10 global anti-Semitic incidents in 2022. Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has more on this scourge that is sweeping the world. According to 2022 Top 10 Worst Global Anti-Semitic Incidents, the Wiesenthal Center put American rapper Kanye West at the top, saying his actions released a tsunami of hate. This is a man before everything fell apart, had over 50 million individuals between uh, Twitter and Instagram over 50 million people. When he spoke, people bought whatever item it was that he was selling. Unfortunately, for reasons we're still not sure, at a certain point, he turned his attention to vilifying the Jewish people. West made a number of anti-Semitic comments and during a December interview, praised Adolf Hitler. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table, especially Hitler. Rabbi Cooper says this behavior injects hatred into the mainstream. You have people saying, uh, some of the black extremists, saying you're not even the real Jews. We love what Hitler did. He went after you because he knew who the real Jews were. Anyone who has any education knows what the Nazi ideology was, it was all based on racism and in race. And, um, you know, given the opportunity, God forbid, if they had won, imagine what would have happened to black people. Concerned about the spread on social media, Cooper went directly to Elon Musk after the billionaire acquired Twitter. In this new free speech, non-censorship era, that he would find a way to deal with extremism and hate speech targeting not just Jews, but all groups. According to the report, FBI Director Christopher Wray confirmed that some 63 percent of all religion-based hate crimes in the U.S. target Jews, who make up only 2.4 percent of the U.S. population. You have now, in the recent hate crimes in the last few days and weeks, you see spray painted, Kanye was right. It used to be uh -huh. Hitler was right. Oh so goodness. we have seen already the weaponization of those words into deeds. It's been wow. a, a horrific year. The January attack on a Texas synagogue by an Islamic extremist from the UK also made the top 10. Shows up on Sabbath morning at the Coleyville synagogue, comes inside, takes the rabbi and the rest of the people there hostage for hours because he wants to get the release of a prisoner at a federal penitentiary nearby who's a woman affiliated with ISIS. So uh, that is not just a hate crime, that's terrorism. Cooper believes local law enforcement needs additional support in order to be more responsive to these hate crimes. You feel that especially in the larger cities, so New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, where religious Jews have been accosted and attacked on the streets directly because some of the people doing those terrible deeds feel, A, they probably won't be arrested, not immediately, although there are cameras around, and then if they are brought in by the PDs who are trying their best, you have cashless bail in New York. One of Cooper's bigger concerns is what's happening on America's college campuses. Where the demonization of Jews and calling into question as far, even as high as the UN, maybe there never should have been a Jewish state, maybe it's not a legitimate thing, they stole people's it land, uh, it's apartheid, it's colonialism. It, what it is, it's a nonstop asymmetrical war against mm -hmm. the Jewish state. And in terms of the local Jewish community or students and sometimes faculty, they're, uh, they're roadkill to these campaigns. And he emphasizes that it's not just in the U.S. Others include the statements that are made by a variety of diplomats working for the United Nations, specifically UN Human Rights Council, mm -hmm. extreme anti-Israel bias, the new special rapporteur for Palestinians, a woman from uh, Italy, is an anti-Semite. And the problem there, again, it's human rights, it's the United Nations, 
and there is no price to pay. One high-profile event happened at a joint press conference with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas in Berlin. At one point, Abbas said Israel was guilty of 50 holocausts against the Palestinians. It took the chancellor a day to respond. There are millions of Europeans who want to believe, in fact do believe, that what the Nazis did to the Jews in the 1930s and 40s, Israelis are doing to the Palestinians today. So when he gives that speech, he knows exactly what he's doing, who he's trying to reach to promote and spread another big lie and to do it in Berlin of all places. Cooper points to the Abraham Accords as one of the biggest accomplishments leading to positive change because leaders on both sides were willing to take risks. One of the greatest disinfectants for bigotry um, and stereotypes is you actually meet someone, you meet the other. He says the Jewish people need allies to stand with them in this fight. Cooper adds the overall goal is to remove anti-Semitism from mainstream culture and put it back in the gutter where it belongs. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up next, teaching the next generation about a man some called a prophet and whom Benjamin Netanyahu called a modern Moses. Israel celebrates its 75th anniversary this year, a milestone that can be traced to Theodore Herzl, known as Israel's spiritual father. Without his unshakable belief that the Jews needed to return to Zion, there might not even be a Jewish state. Paul Strand talked to a leading commentator who's just put together a three-volume look at Herzl's most important writings. Here at the highest point of Mount Herzl, the grave of modern Israel's most famous founder overlooks Jerusalem and the nation he fought so hard for the Jews to once again possess. Theodore Herzl, a refined Jewish gentleman living in Europe, saw a growing hatred of Jews in the late 1800s and feared the prejudice would never end. That's when he realized God's chosen people needed a safer place to live and sought to take them back to their sacred homeland. Imagine where the Jewish people were 125 years ago. Broken, lost, wandering, homeless. And this guy with piercing black eyes and a beautiful black beard and a real sense of dignity says, we are a people, we have ties to a particular homeland and the right to establish a state on that homeland. Zionism, we're gonna to return to Zion. In an effort to keep Israel's history alive for new generations, professor and Jerusalem Post commentator Gil Troy has edited the three volume Zionist writings of Theodore Herzl. He saw that at a time when the French were becoming more French and the Italians were becoming more Italian and there was this amazing thing called America coming together that it was a moment of nationalism. And in order for the Jews to be accepted, truly accepted, truly respected, they needed their own home. Unfortunately, there was this ugly disease called anti-Semitism, which too many Europeans couldn't get over. It traumatized Herzl. And he said, wait a minute, I'm not gonna give in to despair, although he has his dark moments. I'm not gonna give up. I'm gonna find a way home. Herzl, a journalist and playwright, wrote of a strong, confident new breed of people establishing this Jewish homeland. The idea must wing its ways into the most remote, miserable holes where our people dwell. They will awaken from their gloomy torpor. Then, activated, a generation of marvelous Jews will spring into existence. He lobbied world leaders and assembled Jews from all over to Basel, Switzerland for the first World Zionist Congress. That set off a powerful Zionist movement and led to a prophecy. August 29th, 1897, he calls together 208 Jews and by the way says, meet in formal dress because we're dignified people. We're not losers. And he says, after that Congress, and he puts it in his diaries, but he won't put it in public. He says, nobody's gonna believe me, but in Basel we found the, the Jewish state and 50 years from now, people are gonna see that I'm right. And indeed, 50 years later, the United Nations on November 29th, 1947, voted to recognize that Zionist idea that the Jews are a people, they have ties to a particular homeland, and the right to establish a state on that homeland. And a year later, so 51 years later, May 1948, Israel was established. And so he really was a prophet. Activists began to push for a Jewish homeland, and thousands began moving to what the Bible called the Promised Land. The Jews had been scattered from here some 1,300 years before. And though many believe their ancient homeland to be lost forever, Herzl had faith. Here's this guy leading this broken, scattered people, but he believes in the power of an idea. 
He believes that ideas are the force that can move history. Ideas are the a force that can reunite people. Although Herzl died in 1904, his influence helped lead to the 1917 Balfour Declaration, which endorsed the idea of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Herzl's dream was well on its way to fruition. He'd always believed if you push hard enough, a dream, an idea, could become a reality. He wrote that this particular dream of a Jewish return to Zion must be made real. It is as old as our people, which has never, even in times of direst misery, ceased to cherish it. The Jewish state is something the world needs, and consequently, it will come into being. And it has. Up next, a rainy slice of life from the streets of Jerusalem. Israel is in its rainy season now when umbrellas come out and people are dodging puddles. But rain is also a symbol of blessing. So here's a look at God's blessing on Jerusalem. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.